All right, let's uh, get started with what we're going to do today. Um, let's make sure we have all the phones away, laptops are down. Uh, we're going to have more of a discussion day than a work day today. <coughs> so, a couple things about where we are at as far as our lessons. So, we start off with the first module within Canvas, and it is the Hello World module. So we went through all the different modules that are on here, the intro to Xcode, the UI image, all the rest of it. Turn around the screen. And we were working on the final app part of it. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be completed. Remember, the MVP, I believe, was just getting the initial stuff put on. The other stretches are just kind of extra credit at this point. Um, so. As far as I got to work on this thing until it's totally complete, um, you don't have to do that. Um, as long as you have enough completed for the MVP, I can grade you on that. We can move on. There's also a couple other options, too, because um, I don't assign any late work or any penalties for late points in here. So you really have whenever you want to get it in the grade book to have it done. Essentially, it's got to be done by the end of the quarter. So I think that's like four weeks from now. So if you are not ready today or tomorrow or you want to continue to work on it, try to get more stretches, you can do that. If you want to take your grade, move on and do that, you can do that also. If you want to work on it three weeks from now, I can put in a grade now and you can finish the stretches later and get the points for that. So you have some flexibility here. So I think there's a lot of people that are feeling a little bit of anxiety about wanting to, to get this part done. It's great that you want to challenge yourself. However, if you're not quite there yet, um, we're going to move on, try some different stuff. Speaking of, as far as the mechanics of this whole thing, something I do want to show you guys in Xcode, and I should probably cover this with everybody because it's been a bit of an issue lately. Um, hopefully this will pop up fairly fast. So we've had a, a kind of a rash of Sigbert problems, which can be helpful if you type in whatever that error is. Um, that you're coming up with and where it is. If you go to Stack Overflow about that, um, that's usually what I do, and I've been able to find some of that stuff lately. So here's one of the big issues that we're having with people. The app delegate, which is this, which looks an awful lot like your view controller, but it's not your view controller. So your app delegate is really, really cranky. As far as if you make any changes to that, um, your app is usually not going to work. We'll kind of cover app delegate a little bit more in the future, um, but we're not going to do it right now. So if you happen to, you need to make sure that basically that you are in view controller. You're in the view controller when you're working on the code part. That, that part's kind of critical because if you start doing things in the app delegate, um, you're going to have a bad time. Now, the other, re the other thing that I kind of figured out, uh, we figured this out yesterday, for some of the people that are getting Sigiberts, the reason why is because something went wrong with your connections. So if I just open up my view controller here, notice that all of these are connected and it goes all the way down. One of the errors, it won't show up necessarily right here, that the errors that people are having when you have Sigiberts in that app delegate is that you have a connection that's kind of screwed up, which means you might have connected something twice. I saw that yesterday. So for instance, someone took their label and connected their label two different times. That happens. It's also very possible that you got a something connected and then it, it became disconnected or you changed the code or did something where it doesn't work. Generally, if you want to see if you have a problem with your connections, if you look all the way down and they're looking like this, you should be okay. But we saw some yesterday where some were different than the other ones, some were empty. That's kind of a, a big contributor to the Sigurbert problem is connections. And usually if you delete the entire code and also delete the thing, whatever you were connecting to it, that object, um, sometimes you're okay. I don't know. Sigurberts are kind of a tricky thing. So that's one of the main issues I think that people are having that is you got a connection somewhere that's bad. So your connection got a little bit uh, screwed up at some point. Anyway, moving on to what we were doing, and that was not where I wanted to be. This is where I want to be. 
this is kind of where we're going over the next few days. Um, we are going to start with the multiply app. So multiply is ultimately what we get to at the end of this. Um, but these first couple of things, I might be able to just go over today um, because they're not necessarily code related. It's more app design related. So we'll get down to the code challenge for operators. And we'll have to see how this whole thing kind of goes. But the multiply overview, if you click on it, brings you to this wonderful page in which our pre-unit app is display and number. So you're gonna have an app that takes a number entered into a text field and displays it in a label. We're getting a little bit numeric in this one. The end of unit app is a multiply, an app where a user enters numbers, applies an ar arithmetic operator, and it displays the result to the user, which is essentially what a calculator is. So you're going to have you know one plus one in buttons and then it's going to have to generate some sort of a result at the end of that. So we're going to go over some of the differences between variables and constant uh, constants. And this is where the reason why I'm going to go through this a little bit faster is because we actually already know a lot of this stuff. Um, the way that we design the class or the class is designed to start off with, the reason why it's been frustrating for you up to this point is we've kind of thrown you in just to give you a little bit of experience with it. Now we're gonna actually teach you some of the stuff and exactly how it works. So the first thing they have on here is they say that you should read about documentation. You really don't need to read about documentation. So we're gonna skip over the 1.7 part. There's an article down here that's actually a pretty good article. I'm not gonna make you guys read it, um, but what it is, it talks about the hidden power of Stack Overflow. And if you are into code or into technology, you'll kind of figure out how this article is extremely techy. Basically, Stack Overflow is a place where people don't know how to do stuff. They go there and ask questions and people answer it for them. So it really is kind of the social media for app design and for a lot of other computer problems as well. So this is where if people can't figure out how to do something, you go to Stack. For the most part, the stuff you guys are working on, you don't necessarily need to start a Stack account and start asking questions in there because most of the stuff you guys are doing has already been asked. Um, so a lot of places you can go to, you're gonna find your answers for Stack Overflow in there. Now, going back to this part. So decent article about Stack Overflow and why that's important to be able to use. Um, the other thing they have in here is a visual design and uh, adaptivity and layout section. And they have some links to the app, Apple developer tips. So some user interface design stuff. What's going on? What? What? <laughs> So we have some user interface design stuff that Apple kind of walks you through. Again, a lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff we have kind of covered already, but it's just kind of important to know that when you build these things, you, there's a creative element to it because you want to have a decent user experience. So making sure that you're not cramming all your text together, that you're using high resolution photos that don't get blurry, that you don't have distortion like you're stretching them and, and doing some goofy stuff with your photos. Um, also the organization and making sure that you have everything organized in here, it's gonna make it easier for your app, but it's also gonna make you easy, easier for you to understand what the heck you just did. Because that's gonna be a problem that we have, not necessarily with the Multiply app, but moving on to the next one after this, is that we're gonna start adding in more and more and more stuff. Your apps are going to take longer to build because they're going to be more complex. You're going to have multiple pages of apps. So you want to try to keep your stuff as clean as you can. So if you start jamming stuff together, it's going to make it real complicated for you to be able to figure out how that works. So there's a few other things in here about the adaptivity and layout, especially when it comes to screen sizes and what you should be doing. Um, here's the thing that has still has yet to work. Um, maybe when we get to this point, we'll be able to, to have that functional. This thing has never really worked for me all that well, but there is a way to do an auto layout 
So you build your app and then you put these constraints on it and says that no matter what size app we go to, we want it to open up and, and do all these things so it fits any app. That's essentially what we're going for, it fits any phone. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And that's why, you know, if I have an iPhone 6 Plus and somebody else has an X and somebody else has an 8, if we all open up the ESPN Fantasy app, it's going to look the same on all three of our phones, even though our phones are different. We'll get to the constraints thing. It's unfortunately a little bit more difficult and a pain than it should be. It should be just here, make this the same for everything. It doesn't work that way. So that's been constraints is one of the things that if you if there's stuff that you guys are frustrated about, constraints has always frustrated me because it never seems to stink and work. So that's kind of one of my my issues. But we'll get into using auto layout and some of the other stuff. So for right now. We're going to have you guys make your apps for specific phones. Um, I'm talking with Miss Hilby, and I think we're going to probably get a classroom set of iPads in here, maybe about 10 of them, so that you guys have the ability to plug those in and run your stuff on an iPad. I think that's actually where we started with calculators last year, was using the iPads for them. So again, the first couple of things in these modules are good stuff to read, but not necessarily important. Now. As we get to this part, though, this is where things start to get a little bit more important because we are talking about algorithmic thinking. Mr. Schlingen, what is an algorithm? Set of problem-solving operations or calculations that, when executed, proceed in intended results. Produce an intended result. That is what an algorithm is. It's a set of operations that, if handled in order, will produce whatever you want. Now, the reason why algorithmic thinking is important is algorithmic thinking really is everywhere. It's everywhere in your schooling. Your class schedule is an algorithm. And if you pass all of these classes, if you do these things in this sequential order, then at the end of it, you will graduate and you will get a diploma. It's the same thing for when you drive a car. You open the door, you sit in the car, you turn the key, you press the gas, make a few turns correctly, and you go from one destination to another. So it's really kind of all around us in life when you work with algorithms, and that's why they, they give a few examples in the bottom here. A, a chocolate chip cookie recipe. Take Miss Haas's class. She uses algorithms. That's how you cook things. Um, the directions as far as shampoo, lather, rinse, repeat. That is an algorithm for achieving clean hair. Sounds silly, but it's exactly how it works. Any kind of a play in football, it's the same thing. If everybody does their stuff correctly, then you will achieve a desired result when it comes to that. So this part I thought was kind of interesting. They have puzzle solving skills, which are algorithmic thinking skills by trying the Menza International Workout, which is a collection of puzzle questions. How many of you would like to take the Menza quiz today? A couple of people? You don't even remember what your password is, huh? Well, this is the kind of stuff that they have for the Menza Workout, and I believe it's for entertainment purposes. You have a half an hour to answer 30 questions. What's that? Can I take it? You may not. Uh, no. So, for instance, this is what it looks like. What is the word coiled inside of this circle? Very good. Twelve hundred elephants in a herd. Some have pink and green stripes. Some are all pink and some are blue. One third is pure pink. Is it true that four hundred elephants are definitely blue? Wow. So they have some. Fun kind of brain teaser stuff. I was going to wait and see kind of what people's reaction was to it. 
Um, you guys have access to this through Canvas, so if you'd like to take it, you can. It's not going to be a required thing. I think we didn't really have much audience participation in that one. So moving on to the next part. Gentlemen. No, come on. Oh, one thing I did want to do on this, though. This does make a trip back to the book for 2.7, but yeah, we can skip that for now. <coughs> so this kind of moves us into the next part of what we're going into for um, operators. And you can see that we're jumping around again with the textbook. So operators is actually on 1.3. And operators are symbols that make your code work. So you'll use them for doing things like check, change, or combine values. There are operators for working with and comparing numbers, operators for checking true and false values, operators that help you simplify conditional assignments, and more. So in this lesson, you're going to learn about some operators in the Swift language using basic math operators for addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Now, this is the stuff that... I think if I had broken this out three weeks ago, this might have been a little bit difficult for you to understand. At the point you're at right now, this totally makes sense because you've done a lot of this already. So for the first part, assigning a value, use the, uh, the equals operator to assign a value. The name on the left is assign the value to, the, uh, to whatever it is on the right. So this code declares that Luke is your favorite person. So it says let favorite person equal Luke. This is kind of where we left off near the end of your code. This is where you guys started doing these things with the Hello World app. So the equal operator is also used to modify or reassign a value. So the following code declares a shoe size variable and assigns eight as its value. The value is then modified to nine. So if you put in var, which stands for variable, it means that things can change. Shoe size equals eight. Well, then later on you have shoe size equaling nine. It's going to update that because it is a variable and things can change. So we kind of get into the basic arithmetic part of this. Do you have your phone out? Yeah. Why? Remember before though, when I asked you not to have that out? Yeah. Yeah, you should put it away because then I'm going to take it if I see it again. So the basic arithmetic on the on this part is the plus, uh, minus, God, that is hard to see and I can't zoom in on this. Plus, minus, and multiply and the divide operators to perform basic math. So variable of opponent score equals three times eight and the variable of my score equals 100 divided by four. That has a value of 24 and has a value of 25. It'll do the math for you. You don't necessarily have to worry about that part. So when you're building these things, Obviously, making it a variable, because if you make it a constant, you don't really want to get into that part of it. But these are all the different ways that we can do math in it. So you can use operators to perform earthquake values, um, like variable of total score equals opponent score plus my score. It's going to give it a total value of 49. So we do have the ability to piece these things together for it to do math. This is the good news. That this part, it actually gets pretty easy. Unfortunately, it's going to get, stop talking. It's really, really hard to teach when I've got somebody else who's talking at the same time. Do you have anything else to say? I mean, you're done now? Good. Thank you. Now, the way that this is going to get complicated is they're going to start to do some computer rules that are not the same as the math rules which is going to get a little bit on the frustrating side. So an operator can even reference the current variable updating it to its new value. So my score equals my score plus three. It will add stuff in there. Now the problem is, is for decimal point precision, you need to do the same operations on double values. They use this thing called a double. It's actually a code you can put in. A double is if you want to have decimal. So the problem is if you start to mix these things together, if you have a regular variable and you don't declare it as a double, this is where stuff can start to crash. And that's why 
this math part tends to get a little bit on the difficult side. All right, what I want you guys to do is to open up and go to this page, because this is just way too stinking hard to read. Page 36 of the book. It is page 36. So this might be a little bit easier for you guys to follow along because of my board being a little bit on the blurry side. But about halfway down it says when you use the division operator, and it's talking about the divide slash on int values. Int stands for integer. So if you are going to add in something with a whole number, that's an integer. Integers and doubles do not like to play together. So remember, double is a variable that's going to have a decimal point. Integer is just going to be any whole number. So for instance, the example they give you is let x equal 51, let y equal 4, and then let z equal y, uh, z equals x divided by y. That part will not work because you're starting to get into this problem with decimals. If it if the outcome is a decimal, it's not going to be able to work unless you set it up as a double and it's able to see that. I know that this is really kind of theoretical and as we start to work on this, I think when you get a little bit more hands on, it's going to make a little bit more sense. But if you look over on the compound side, like the variable of my score equaling 10, my score equals my score plus three, that's going to update because that's a variable. Nice and easy to do. As we get down to some of the other ones, the order of operations, this is where it also gets a little bit on the tricky side. So order of operations, mathematic operations always follow a specific order. Multiplication and division have priority over addition and subtraction. And parentheses have priority over all four. That is also going to be different. <laughs> so that is not necessarily what you guys learn in math class. So there are some priority stuff here. So multiplication and division will happen first. Addition and subtraction will happen second. But if you put something in parentheses, then it's going to work. So they give you a couple more examples in here as far as how things are going to work. But let's take a look at this first one in the review questions. What is the value of my number at the end of the following code? So let my number equal x plus y plus z. So 2 plus 4 plus 6 equals 1. Equals 12. Check my answer. Yep, it works. What is the value of my number at the end of the following code? So let x, y, and z equals 2, 4, and 6. What is that answer going to be on the second one? So 2 plus 4 times 6. I use your operation. Well, you need to use your order of operations because, huh? It will be 26. And that's where we get into the order of operations part that I just talked about because the computer is going to do the multiplication side of this first. So what is that? 4 times 6, 24, plus 2. So it's choosing that multiplication part first, then doing the rest of it. I think that's a little bit backwards from at least the way that I was taught math. You kind of go left to right and do everything and then work on it from there. So that is a little bit on the tricky side. All right, next one. What is the value of my number at the end of the following code? So 2 times 4 minus 6. 2 is correct. All right, what about this one? X plus Y times Z. All 
All right. So with this one, let x equal 14, let y equal 2.5, let, let result equal x times y. What's going to be the problem? B. B, the code will not compile because x is an integer and y is a double. <laughs> what is a double? All right, what is the operator called when the arithmetic or Am I saying that right? Arithmetic symbol in front. All right. So plus and equals, if you see something like that, it is basically saying it's a compound. It puts it together. It's a compound assignment operator. So it can have multiple things that happen with that particular one. All right. So moving back over to Canvas, and again, I know we're having kind of a long day today. Bear with me here on this part. Go ahead and put your laptops down. I'm going to show you a little bit of Bob. In this series, we're going to be going over the common operators that you're using while writing this way. In this video, we're going to start with the basic four that you're likely to already this part's going to be important, guys, because, again, you're building a calculator very, very soon, and you're going to want to know how to do some of this stuff. Perfect. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So let's go ahead and create a new variable that we're going to be using as we go. We declare a variable with a bar, and then we give it a name. Let's call it result. And then to assign to it, we use an equal sign. And on the right hand side, we put what we want the result to be equal to. Let's do 5 plus 3. And you see on the right, we get 8, which is what we expect. Now let's try subtraction. Let's do result equals 5 minus 3. And on the right, we get two. Multiplication now. Result equals five. If multiplication, we use the star or asterisk symbol. Now, what's going on with this right now is he's in Playgrounds. It's when you open it up, rather than building a new single app, it gives you that ability to go into Playgrounds. This is how you can test code. I think it actually works for us now. It never worked last year, so nobody had the ability to actually test this stuff out. But essentially what you're seeing here is a, a modified version of an app where you can put in your code, and when you run it, you get this result. Well, this kind of functions exactly like a label. So if you had a label set up that was displaying the result of whatever that was, this is where it would show up. So this is how we're going to do these things. If you're going to have in your calculator a label where you have your end result show up, this is how you want it to work. And you're going to set it up with different kinds of math equations. Oh, keep going there. Five times three. Let me get 15. Now division result equals let's do six divided by three. We use the forward slash to indicate division. And we get two. So these are the common operators, and they're pretty self explanatory. But you can also, on the right hand side, put variables in instead of explicit numbers. Let's see what that looks like. Let's start off with a new variable bar, and we'll call this one new result. And we'll set it equal to result times 2. And we get 4. We get 4 because result in this case is going to contain the last value that it had from our previous operation. Whenever we did 6 divided by 3, that gave us 2 and stored it inside of result. So down here, whenever we use it, we're essentially doing 2 times 2 which of course gives us four. 
Now, one thing to keep in mind is that there's an order of operations in most programming languages. Multiplication and division in Swift take precedence over addition and subtraction. So if we were to do new result equals, and let's do five plus three times two. And we get 11. If the addition was going first, 5 plus 3 equals 8, times 2 would be 16. But since the multiplication takes precedence, 3 times 2 equals 6, plus 5 equals 11. So what if you want to change the order of operation? Well, we can do that using parentheses, similar to how you would use parentheses in mathematics. We can just go back to our 5 plus 3, wrap them in parentheses, and that tells Swift that we want the 5 plus 3 to be evaluated first and then multiply it by 2. And of course, now we get 16. So this is a brief introduction to operations in Swift. Okay, I'm going to stop it there so you guys can be done for the day. Um, I know that was a lot of information, but this is probably going to be one of the more frustrating things that you're going to work with. I've always found the math portion of this to be a little bit irritating because of the number of things that you connect and then having your math problems not working out and you not knowing why. Well, that's essentially what it is, but.